So I will try to read Prince Vaughn and the Grey Wolf. I think that's a, a good way to get started in this. All right. Um, can, I wish I can, maybe I can zoom in here. Okay. Um, this is the tale of Ivan and the, the gray wolf. There was once in a certain kingdom, a certain state, where lived the Tsar, Caesar, um, Vislav, Andronovich, and he had three sons. The first was called Dmitri, the second was Vasily, and the third was Ivan. This Tsar had a garden so rich that in no other kingdom was there anything better than in the, that garden main, and in that garden many rare trees grew with fruits and without fruits. The Tsar had an apple tree which he lo especially loved, and on that apple tree all the apples that grew were of gold. But it happened that the bird of light began to visit Tsar Vislav's garden. The feather of the bird were all gold, but the eyes were like crystals of the east. It flew into the garden every night, sat on the apple tree beloved of Tsar Vislav, and plucked the golden apples. Tsar Vislav and Andronovich was deeply saddened. He called to him his three sons and said, My beloved children, which of you will go into my garden and catch the bird of light? Who, he who will capture it alive will receive half of my kingdom. While I live and at my death he shall have it all. Then his children, the Tsaravici, said in a single vo voice, Gracious Lord, our Father, your Imperial Majesty, we will, with the greatest pleasure, try to catch the bird of light alive. On the first night, Dmitri Tsarevich went into the garden and sat under the apple tree from which the bird of light was stealing the apples. But he went to sleep and never heard the bird of light as it landed and plucked the apples. In the morning, Tsar Vitslav and Andrevich called his son Dmitri to him, and he asked him, Well, my beloved son, did you see the bird of light or did you not? And he answered, Father, gracious Lord, the night it did not come. So the next night, Vasily Tsarevich went to keep watch in the garden. He sat under the same apple tree. After an hour, he went to sleep so soundly that he never heard the coming of the bird of light, which perched on the tree and plucked many more apples. In the morning, Tsar called his son and questioned him. He answered, Gracious Lord, my father, this night the bird of light did not come. On the third night, Ivan went into the garden to watch and sat under the same apple tree. He waited one hour, a second hour, and a third hour, and then the whole garden lit up as though it shone with many fires, and the bird of light arrived and began to pluck the apples. Ivan Tsarevich, stealing beneath the bird, seized it by its tail, only he could not keep hold of it, and was left clutching a single tail feather. In the morning, when Tsar Vaslav awoke from his sleep, Ivan Tsarevich went to him and gave him the, bird, the feather of the bird of light. Tsar Vislav was glad that his son um, had succeeded, although he had only a single feather. This feather was so marvelous and bright that you had only to take it into the, some dark attic and show in it as bright as the red sun. Tsar Vislav put the feather into the cabinet to treasure it forever. From that time forward, the bird of light never flew into his garden. Tsar Vislav once again called his children on to him and said, My beloved sons, Journey forth, and I will give you my blessing. You must seek the bird of light and bring it to me alive. And I repeat my promise, he who will capture the bird of light shall have half my kingdom and the rest when I die. Dmitri and Vasily, the two older brothers, envious that their younger brother, Ivan, had, that had succeeded in capturing a feather from the bird of light's tail, set off in search of the bird. Ivan Sarovich, too, asked his father to permit him to go on a quest. Tsar Vislav tried to keep his youngest son back, but he could not withstand Ivan's relentless pleas. Ivan Tsarevich received his father's blessing, took his horse, and went on his way, not knowing whether he will, where he was going. Ivan rode along highways and byways, but whether his traveled near or far, we do not know, for a tale is soon told, but the deed is not soon done. At last he reached an open field and green meadows, and in the open field there stood a stone column, and on the column these words were written, Whoever goes straight ahead from this column, he shall have hunger and cold. Whosoever goes right, he shall have health and life, but his horse shall be slain. 
Whosoever goes to the left, he shall be slain, but his horse shall have life and be healthy. Yvonne read this description, and he went to the right, thinking to himself that even if his horse were to be slain, he would still be alive. He kept on one day and a second and a third day, when suddenly a fierce gray wolf appeared, approached, and said, Hail, brave young Ivan Tsarevich! Why have you come this way? Have you not read engraved on the column that your horse shall be slain? And the wolf, speaking these words, cleft the horse in two and disappeared. After shedding bitter tears for his horse, Ivan Tsarevich continued on foot. He walked all day and grew extremely weary. Just as he was about to rest a while, the gray wolf appeared and said, I pity you, Ivan Tsarevich, that I killed your horse, so that now you must wander through the world on foot. Come, sit on me, and the gray wolf, and his say, whither I shall take you and to what end. Ivan Tsarevich told the gray wolf everything, and the gray wolf sped up from um, off with his him swifter than any horse, and in a short time, as it might be in a single night, he conducted Ivan Tsarevich to a stone wall, stopped, and said, Now, Ivan Tsarevich, jump off me, off the gray wolf, and climb over the stone wall. There is a garden behind the wall, and in this, that garden the bird of light is sitting in a golden cage. You must take the bird of light, but you must not touch the golden cage, or they will capture you at once. Climbing over the stone wall, Ivan Sarovich spied the bird of light in its golden cage and was greatly pleased. Taking the bird out of the cage, he was just turning to leave when he said to himself, Why should I take the bird of light without the cage? Where shall I put it? So he turned back, but as soon as he touched the golden cage, a clamor and a clangor sounded in the garden as though there were ropes attached to the cage. All the watchmen awoke, ran into the garden, seizing Ivan with the bird of light, took him to their Tsar, who was called Dolmat. Furious, Tsar Dolmat yelled, Are you not ashamed of yourself, young man, to come stealing? Who are you? Of what land? Who is your father? How do they call you on earth? Ivan Tsarevich answered him, I am the son of Tsar Vislav Andronovich, and they call me Ivan Tsarevich. Every night your bird of light flew into our garden and stole the golden apples from the apple tree my father loves. For that reason, my father sent me to seek the bird of light and to take it with him. Um, oh, brave young Ivan Tsarevich, Tsar Dolmat cried. I would certainly have given you the bird, but was what you did right? If you had come to me, I should have given you the bird of light as an honor. But now should I not send messengers to all the kingdoms of the world to proclaim your dishonorable act? Now listen, Ivan Tsarevich. If you will do this with do, do me the service, if you will go across three thrice nine kingdoms into the thrice tenth realm, and will you there obtain for me Tsarafran's golden man maned horse, I will forgive you and will honor you with the bird of light. Greatly downcast, Ivan Tsarevich left Tsar Dolmat and returned to the Grey Wolf, told him everything. Brave Ivan Tsarevich, said the Grey Wolf to him, why did you not listen to my words? Why did you take the golden cage? I am guilty before you, replied Ivan Tsarevich. Well, so be it, said the gray wolf. Sit on me, and the gray wolf, I will take you wherever you wish. Ivan sat on the gray wolf's back, and the wolf sped off on the journey. Maybe far, maybe near, and nightfall reached by the kingdom of Tsar Afran, where when he had come to the Tsar's table of sables of gleaming white stones, the gray wolf said to Ivan Tsarevich, Get down, Ivan. Go into the white stone stables and take the golden-maned horse. Only do not touch the golden bridle which han han hangs on the wall, or it will go ill with you. Ivan Sarovich went into the white stone stable, took the horse, and started to leave. When his glance fell on the golden bridle hanging on the wall, he reached out to take it from the hook, but as soon as he touched it, there arose a clangor and a clamor throughout all the stables, as though there were ropes attached to the bridle. The watchman awoke, seized Ivan Tsarevich with the golden-named horse, maned horse, and took him to the Tsar Afran. Tsar Afran was furious with Ivan Tsarevich and demanded who he was, who was his father, and what was his name. When Ivan had told him and explained his errand, Tsar Afran said, 
I would have certainly given you the golden-maned horse if you had asked me for it. But since you have dealt this dishonorably with me, you must do me a service, and then I will give you the golden-maned horse with the bridle. You must ride across thrice nine lands and to the thrice tenth kingdom and obtain for me Princess Elena the Fair, whom I have loved um, with all my heart and soul, but cannot gain. In return for this, I will give you and give you what you sought as an honor. But if you do not do this for me, the service I will proclaim throughout all the, ser the realms all of the world that you are a dishonorable thief. Ivan Sarovich left the palace and began to weep bitterly. Soon he reached the Grey Wolf and related how it had gone with him. Brave y Ivan Sarovich, the Grey Wolf said, why did you not listen to my words and take the golden bridle? I am guilty before you, said Ivan Sarovich. Well, so be it, the wolf, Grey Wolf went on. Sit on my back in the Grey Wolf, I will take you wherever you wish. So Ivan Sarovich sat on the Grey Wolf's back and the Grey Wolf darted off. At last he arrived at the kingdom of Princess Alina the Fair and at the golden palisade which surrounded the go wonderful garden. The wolf said to Tsarevich, Ivan Tsarevich, slip off my back, off the gray wolf, and go back along the road and wait for me in the open fields upon the green oak. Ivan Tsarevich did as he was bidden, and the gray wolf hid near the golden palisade, waiting until Princess Alina the Fair should come into the garden for her evening walk. In the evening, when the sun was setting fast into the west, Princess Alina went into the garden with all her maids of honor and servants and attended and all the boyarni countesses surrounding her. When she was near, the gray wolf leaping across the palisade seized Princess Alina the fair. When he reached the open field under the green oak where Ivan Tsarevich was waiting, he said, Ivan Tsarevich, be swift, sit on my back in the gray, on the gray wolf. Ivan Tsarevich mounted him, and the gray wolf dashed off with him, them both to the kingdom of Tsar Hefron. All the maids of honor and the servants, attendants, and Boyanis ran swiftly into the palace and began to set up a hunt for the fair Princess Alina and the gray wolf. But however many the hunters, they could not capture the gray wolf, and so disheartened, they all turned back home again. Ivan Sarovich, sitting um, seated on the gray wolf's back with the Princess Alina the Fair, fell in love with her, and she with him. And when the gray wolf arrived in the garden of Tsar Fran, the Tsarevich grew very sad and began to weep. The gray wolf asked him, Why are you weeping, Tsarevich? And Ivan Tsarevich answered him, Oh, my friend, the gray wolf, why should I not weep? I love Princess Alina the Fair with all my heart, and now I must give her up to Tsar Fran in exchange for the golden-maned horse. And if I do not give her up, then Tsar Fran will dishonor me throughout all the kingdoms. I have served you well, Ivan Tsarevich, the gray wolf replied, and I will serve you once more. Hear me, Ivan Tsarevich. I will turn myself into the fair Princess Elena. You will take me to the Tsar Fran, and he will then take me as his queen. When he gives you the golden-maned horse, I, you ride far away. Then I will ask Tsar Fran, leave to walk in the open field, and while I am taking my walk, with the maids of honor, servants, serving maids, attendants, and the boy and me. Then think of me, and I shall be with you once again. His speech finished, the gray wolf struck the gray earth and turned himself into Prince Elena. Ivan Sarovich went into the palace of Tsar Efron, leading the spo supposed Elena the fair by the hand. Then the Tsar was joyous in his heart that he had re reached, received such a treasure, which he had been desiring so long and he gave the golden-maned horse to Ivan Tsarevich. Ivan Tsarevich rode the golden-maned horse back to where Alina the Fair was waiting, and with her seated behind him, they rode off to the kingdom of Tsar Dolmat. The gray wolf stayed one day with Tsar Efron, and a second day, and a third, in the stead of the fair princess Elena, and then he asked leave of Tsar Efron to go out and walk in the open field that he might drive out the ravening sorrow from his heart. Then Tsar Afran said to him, O oh, my fair queen Alina, I will do anything for you. And he promptly bade the maids of honor to the servants and the attendants and the boyarni to go with him and the fair princess into the open field to walk. Ivan Tsarevich went on his way and rode with Alina the fair, and they had almost forgotten the gray wolf when of a sudden he recollected, Oh, where is the, my gray wolf? Instantly the gray wolf appeared before Ivan Tsarevich, 
and sit and said, "Sit on me, Ivan Tsarevich, on the gray wolf, and the gr- prince, fair princess, can ride on the golden maned steed." Ivan Tsarevich sat on the gray wolf, and so went on in the kingdom of the Tsar Dolmet, maybe far, maybe near. And when they reached the, that kingdom, then they stopped three versts, two miles, out of the town. And Ivan beseeched the gray wolf, "Listen to me, my beloved friend." The gray wolf, you have done so many services for me. Serve me one last time. Can you not turn yourself into the golden-maned horse? Then the gray wolf struck the gray earth and became the golden-maned horse. And leaving the fair Alina in the green meadow, Ivan Tsarevich sat on the gray wolf and rode into the palace of Tsar Dolmat. As soon as ever Tsar Dolmat saw that Ivan Tsarevich was riding the golden-maned horse, he came out of his palace, met the Tsarevich in the open courtyard, kissed him on his smooth cheek, took him by his right hand, and led him into the white palace. Joyfully, Tsar Dolmat bade a feast be prepared. They sat at oaken tables covered by checkered tablecloth, and they ate, drank, and made merry for two days. On the third day, Tsar Dolmat delivered to Ivan the bird of light with the golden cage. The Tsarevich, taking the golden bird, left and rejoined Princess Alina the fair. Together they rode back to the, his own country. The next day, Tsar Dolmat took his golden maned horse into the open field. But as soon as he spurred the horse, it reared and turned into the great gray wolf, caught up with Ivan Tsarevich and said, Sit on me, the gray wolf, and let Princess Alina the fair ride on the golden maned horse. Ivan Tsarevich sat on the gray wolf, and they began the last journey of their, uh, the last part of their journey. When they reached the pa- place where the gray wolf had cleft Ivan's horse in two, the gray wolf said, Now, Ivan Tsarevich, I have served you well and faithfully. On this spot I cleft your horse in two, and to this spot I have returned you. Slip off me, off the gray horse, the gray wolf. Now you have your golden-maned horse. I will serve you no more. As the gray wolf spoke these words, he disappeared into the forest, and Ivan Tsarevich wept bitterly for the gray wolf. Then he and the fair Alina continued riding home on the golden-maned horse. When he was only twenty versts from his own kingdom, Ivan got off his horse and together with the fair Alina took shelter for the night under a tree, with the golden-maned horse tied up to the tree and the bird of light in its cage on the grass. Now it happened that Ivan's brother Dmitri and Vasily were just returning from their fruitless search for the bird of light. When they came back, when they came upon their sleeping brother and the fair princess Elena, when they saw the golden-maned horse and the bird of light in the golden cage, they were delighted and agreed that they would slay their brother Ivan Tsarevich. With his sword, Dmitri cleft Ivan Tsarevich in two, and arousing the, prince, the fair princess and asked her, Fair maiden, from what kingdom art thou? Who was thy father, and how did they call thee on earth? The fair princess Alina, seeing Ivan Tsarevich was dead, was terror-struck and weeping bitterly, said, I am Princess Elena the Fair, whom Ivan Tsarevich carried off from an unwanting marriage. Now you have delivered him to an evil death. If you have had been true champions, you would have gone with him into the open field and have slain him in fair fight. But you have slain him in his sleep. And who will honor you for that? Is not a man asleep as one that is dead? Then Dmitri Tsarevich pointed his sword at fair Princess Elena's and, and said, Listen, Elena the Fair. You are now in our hands. We will take you to the, your, our father, Tsar Vislav Andronovich. And you are to tell him that we found you and the bird of light and the golden maned steed. If you do not do this, we will slay you at once. Princess Alina the Fair was frightened and swore by all the holy relics that she would do as she was bidden. Then Dmitri Tsarevich and Vasily Tsarevich began to cast lots who should have the fair Princess Alina, and who should have the golden-maned horse. And the lot fell that the fair Princess Alina should belong to Vasily and the horse to Dmitri. After Ivan Tsarevich lay dead where he had been slain for thirty days, the gray wolf came upon him and, and wished to revive him, but knew not how. Just then he saw a raven from her nestling flying round the body, ready to devour Ivan Tsarevich. The gray wolf sprang from behind the bush and laid hold of one of the nestlings and was going to tear it in two. Then the raven alighted on the ground near the gray wolf, begged, Don't touch my child, it has done you no harm. 
hear me, Raven, I will not touch your son, but if you will do this service, um, do me a service. Fly across thrice nine lands into the thrice tense kingdom realm and bring me the water of life and the water of death. Then the raven said, Grey wolf, I will do this service. Only do not touch my son. And with these words, the raven flew away. On the third day, the raven returned and brought with him two files. In one was the water of life and in the other, the water of death. He gave these to the gray wolf and the gray wolf took the files, cut the nestles in two, sprinkled him with the water of death and the nestling, nestling grew together. When he sprinkled him with the water of life and the nestling a nestling um, sh uh, shook himself and flew away. Then the gray wolf sprinkled Ivan Sarvich with the water of death, and his body clove together. He sprinkled him with the water of life, and Ivan Sarvich rose, saying, Oh, what a long sleep I have had. The gray wolf said to him, Yes, Ivan Sarvich, you might have slept forever if I had not been here, for your brothers have robbed you, and they have taken Princess Selina the fair, the golden-maned horse, and the bird of light with them. Now listen, today is the day that your brother Vasily will marry your bride, Princess Alina the Fair. You must hasten home as fast as possible. Sit on me on the gray wolf and I will take you there. Ivan Sarovich sat on the gray wolf, and the wolf sped home in the, to the kingdom of Tsar Vislav Andrevinovich. He reached the town and in no time arrived at the palace. Ivan waited to reveal himself until his brothers had returned with the princess from the coronation, and they were seated at the banquet table. When Alina the Fair saw Ivan Tsarevich, she jumped up at once from her chair and began to kiss his uh, lips and cried out, Oh, here is my beloved bridegroom, Ivan Tsarevich. This is my true bridegroom, not that evil one who sits at the table. Then Tsar Ivislav Andrevich arose from his seat and began to question the Princess Alina the Fair as to the meaning of her words. When Tsar Ivislav Andrevich um, learned the truth, his anger was boundless. Dmitri and Vasily were confined in the darkest dungeon. Ivan Tsarevich married the Princess Alina the Fair, and they lived with such friendship and love that one was never seen without the other. Ah, uh, the end. Okay, I'll put on the, the screen. Yeah. So a long story, but I think it's important to read through it all to have, at least have a context of of what is going on here. Um, so um, the first thing we notice is that uh, when when Sir Yvonne is um, the two brothers go in to the garden to defend the tree from the 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 firebird that comes down every once in a while, and um, and to catch him. Um, now the idea with the firebird. Is it something from above? It's like something heavenly that for only a second will come down. And if you're awake, you can catch this, this beautiful divine thing, which, um, and when it comes down, they're both asleep and they can't catch it. But Sir Yvonne is able to be awake and just barely catch a feather. That's the only thing he can catch, only a glimpse of it. And th this right here could be a symbol of like taking the apple, for example. Not exactly moral though, not, not a moral thing. But it's it's the story is kind of devoid of morals in a weird way. It doesn't have like a have it doesn't have like a, a moral to the story like, uh, like whatever. Don't talk to strangers or something. It's more of like an idea of how how sin gives us punishments, but it also kind of in some weird way gives us something in return, like the apple, for example. Um, so Yvonne steals the apple. He's awake in this. By being awake, he has made himself better than his brothers. Um, and after um, he gets the apple, he, um, he the 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 little bit of the the bird, the king cannot handle not having the full thing. And that's like us in our sin. We are we don't we can't handle having only had the taste of the the tree of knowledge of of good and evil, but we haven't eaten the tree of life and death, and we we crave it after this, this point in our fallen world um so um so then he sets off his three sons to go on a greater quest to go and catch the, the full bird so he can have all of it and um the two brothers go to the path and they they're they're confused by it obviously because it's a it's a dangerous journey and if you can if you can't even stay awake at a garden 
there's no way that you're going to be able to, to decide between three treacherous paths, one that will starve you to death and one that will kill your horse and the other one that will kill you. And uh, so they, they both can't take that journey and they're, they're afraid of that journey. But Yvonne staying awake and taking the consequences of himself goes on the one that keeps him alive, which is sacrificing his horse. And you have to think about the horse as an extension of yourself. It's not exactly, it's not exactly just like another animal. It's, it really is something that extends your, your power. It makes you able to, uh, to move faster. It uh, makes you not tired. It, it has a lot of benefits to it. it makes you taller. Um, so going on this path, he, he chooses his sacrifice and he knows that he, that at least he's not sacrificing himself, but he, all of himself, but he can at least sacrifice a small part of himself. And by sacrificing himself, he gains a new kind of, of mount, a new horse, which is a wild wolf. And this wild wolf is, is dangerous. You don't want to, you don't want to push the buttons with it. You don't want to, to go too far with it. But at the same time, it is much faster and it's much more deadly and cunning and has tricks that that are great. I think that you can think of this gray wolf as kind of like the images of death that we go through in our own life where we are uh, we we wear these skins of death, these things that will extend our power, um, but are ways to protect us from the outside world and to get get jobs done. And the problem with this power is that you could get obsessed with it. It could take control of you entirely. And so um, so it's, there's something kind of wrong about having the great gray wolf. You don't really want to you don't really want to hold on to it too much, but you also notice how great its its power is. Um, when he steals the things in the kingdom, um, the gray wolf warns him that you can take this thing. And you can you can steal it, but if you hold on to what what ca captivates it, or the shell of it, if you hold on to its shell, you're going to you're going to die. You're going to get caught. You're going to um, pay for your your sins, you know. But if you only grab onto what what I say that you can grab onto, you will live. You will be fine. Um, and of course, Yvonne falls the first time with and grabs the the cage around the bird. Um, the thing that holds it to this world, he grabs the outer shell of this thing, and by grabbing it, he he is caught, and goes on. And it, just his journey becomes more and more complicated. And th then he goes for the horse, and he grabs the bridle, and then that becomes more and more complicated. Where it's now you have to go and catch, the, you have to go and get this woman. But now, when it came to this woman, the thing is funny is there's really not there's not really anything that ties her down to this world because it, it, it it's it's like this weirdness where. She is kind of is in this world. Her beauty is what you're trying to grab her for, you know, and and, and she's supposed to be like this in between between the divine and the worldly, like like that. What the shell of her is what is her as well. So you you almost like you can't really fail once you've once you've gone that deep into this this trap, right? And so he gets the woman, and um. Of course, with the great beauty of the woman, he falls in love, and he starts to realize that 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 what he really wanted all along was the woman, or was the bird, or was the horse. The, the cage did not matter. That the bridle didn't matter. The outer shell didn't matter. The feathers didn't matter. It was it was really the core of the thing that he cares about. And by figuring out this this that he loves the core of it, not the shell, um, he has to pay for his his crime. He he has. Um, he has died. He has, he has sinned and he stole. And so, um, what happens is once he lays down, um, once he lays down to, um, go to sleep, his brothers who are still that are in, pay him back for his sin, they do exactly the same thing as, as he has done with the bird or with, with others. And he, he, in his secretness is slain and he's split into many parts or split in two. He's, he, um, his existence is totally turned into a uh, complexity that is just a mess. It's just a mess. And that's that's how we feel when we are in sin. Our life is a mess. Um, but what the the wolf does, one the one last thing that is uh, redeeming of this wolf that is that he brings the tree of life and death. He grabs a bird from the sky, just like the just like the the, the just like the firebird 
he grabs something that comes up from the sky and he grabs it. And by grabbing it, he's able to bring a potion of life and death. And that potion of life and death, the death potion kind of like is what brings him together. And then the life is what brings him back to life. And he thinks he's just fallen asleep, which is what it is when we, we, we go through baptism is we've died and we've, we've fallen. We've been split in many parts, but then the water rejuvenates us. And it's as if we had just fallen asleep. Like, like we are back entirely. Um, yeah. And I think the, the core to this is that it's not, it's not exactly a moral story. So you, you get this idea that he's, he, he steals and he kind of gets away with it, but, um, and it's not correct for him to have still stolen the things to begin with, but, he, um, but he kind of, he, he grows to understand that what he really wanted to begin with was, was the core of these things. And, um, and, and through that, there, there is a sort of moral note to it. There is a resurrection, there's a death, there's, there's a fall from the Garden of Eden, where he falls out of, out of these, these kingdoms and has to go and find other kingdoms to, to, um, steal from, to, to get back, um, and it um and it does show us that we have we do have these gray wolves in our own lives too. Like a good example of a gray wolf that we all have is like anger. Like when we show anger. Like sometimes, you know, if you use a little bit of anger, you can get your way. You can say something and you can you can show some um conviction for something and all of a sudden now things fall to your hands, you know, you have you have this thing. You show that you're passionate about something. You cry, for example. If you cry, people will show that you really are hurt and that you need help or something. But there's a, a trick to this, though, that if you if you rely on it too much, if you take this and use it as a trick entirely, you'll abuse it and you will get caught for 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 how much you've used it. You know. So if you cry um, for every problem or if you are angry at everybody all the time, um, that sin is going to it's gonna it's going to mess you up. It's going to let you die. Um, and you, you have to be careful with where we go with those those extensions of our power. The other thing to relate this to, and this is this is overall a story of of it's interesting because this the the gray wolf this story is an Eastern story from Russia, and the Holy Grail is more or less Gaelic or Celtic, and um, um, and but they have a similar idea here where the Holy Grail itself is something sacred it's 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 a very uh it, it and we we don't know where it is we don't we, we can't catch it or whatever but it's kind of supposed to be not catchable um and what we know of it is that it's a relic and that it it has something to do with the sacrament of of of, of communion um and that you know we know that these relics these things that have touched sacred things kind of carry with them a power there's there's something that is that is like something that we want to grab onto, but if we do grab onto it without without with unclean hands, they kind of uh, they kill us. Or, but if we are pure of heart, these things will bestow their power on us. It's a way of kind of showing who was righteous and who wasn't. The two brothers being unrighteous, and the one brother being righteous had grabbed the feather. You know, it's it's these things that that show forth like who is the the, the chosen one in a way out of these three brothers. As the honey is in the wax, so he that is David will hold in a spiritual sense in a historical instrument. Is This is a, a prophecy that was being told by an angel to the father of St. David of Wales, um, which is a, a beautiful way of just saying that, I mean, it's, it's just symbolism in general. It's just the it's, honey to wax is what David is, a spiritual sense to the historical instrument. So you just get the, like like how wax is like, like the concrete of what is honey, um, David David's spiritual energy has become concrete in the historical instrument of whatever the chalices, the things in his life, the the altars, the it, it's all become concrete through the actions of the saint. Um, um, the the other thing to think about is these birds that 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 have the life and death and the bird of fire. They're they're floating between these two, the earth and and heaven, and um, this is another theme that that falls through into Celtic religion as well, and Celtic pagan religion, and also Catholic um, is uh, 
the idea that there's these altars that kind of float. They don't touch the ground exactly because if they were to touch the ground, they would be of this world. But they kind of come, you can, every once in a while, you can see like through a cloudy day, you can see the clouds form above you and they become kind of like an altar of heaven and earth and the, the joining of the two. And that is what we're trying to grab onto is that, that, that moment where earth and heaven kind of unite in a way. Arthur sees the grail. Five forms are given. First, a bell, and a fifth, a chalice, chalice, and the other three are unknown. When, when Arthur, King Arthur in this story, um, the story, the mythical story, of course, um, sees the grail, five forms are given. It's, it's, we, we only know two of the forms, and we can see that the first is like a bell, which is kind of, it's kind of sacred, but it's not as sacred as the chalice, which is what holds communion or holds the blood of Christ, you know? Um, the other three, we don't know. And it gives us the sense that they're almost more heavenly than, than of this earth. That like it, it, for a second, the grail kind of floats into like a heavenly form that we're unable to even witness. And we don't want to witness because that's the beauty of a sacred, of a sacred sacramental mysterious thing is that we want it to be a little bit out of our grasp so that we can find something to reach up to. Um, the Holy Grail is, so now this is where it's interesting. So the Holy Grail, the idea of it is that it's it's lost. And the whole idea from the beginning is that this, there's, this, there's this chalice that is lost and we need to find it wherever it is. Um, but it what that means to us is it's really, it's lost tradition. It's it's like it's like this thing that we could have went back to and we could have grabbed and if, if only we could have it, we would feel... Um, we would feel united again if we could find that thing. We could find the power that we used to have. One example of that is that the, these, the story of the Holy Grail really came about during the Fourth Crusade when the Church of the West and the Church of the East no longer found any way to be reunited. They felt like there was, there was something like that just would, it would, never have, it would never come back together. And it came also at the time where people started to make the question of consubstantiation versus transubstantiation. And with both of those questions, you're you're split apart, and you just you've lost the tradition. You've lost what you once had, and you you can't handle not having it. And so you have to kind of go back to it, kind of like the king who has the feather, and he just needs the full bird. He needs to go on this giant quest to find the bird. Um, um, he goes and he finds. Um, we 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 have this idea. We talk about the Grail, but every time we talk about it, it seems like it's just farther and farther away, and that we'll never be able to reach it. And it's, it's something that we, we have some hope for still. And, we, and this is the idea of the West, is we want to have hope for finding this thing that was lost entirely, that has been dead and farther away than we could ever imagine. We have hope that we'll find it either now or in the next life. And so we, we hold on to these, these grails, these lost traditions, and we hope that they are brought back to their full unity. Um, so one form of the Holy Grail in there is that the bird's feather but the other form of the holy grail is the princess and the princess is is like a concrete thing it is a container that that holds something beautiful it is it is the thing that is that is good in its own nature there's there's no need it's so it's so holy that that you can see all of its beauty in its shell it's so great that it's that if you have if you had it there would be no question of transubstantiation or consubstantiation. There'd be no question of East or West or whatever. The power that emanates from this container would be so great that you would be able to just um, fall in, in total clarity and total power. Um, and that's kind of where Prince Yvonne really realizes, this is, we, this is where we realize our death, is, is that where we, we kind of go back towards, yeah, towards our baptism, is when we realize there are things that, that there's a shell that we we like, but but we that we want the core, and sometimes to find the core, you need to have something so beautiful that the core is a shell as well. And I I think that that really does play out in in marriage. I think especially where um, things like charity come out in both a practical sense, but also in in a real spiritual sense as well. You buy something for your kid and. It's, it feels like it's for you. You feel like you've done something selfish because you bought something for your kid, but it's with total heart of charity and all in, out of love for somebody else. And you make a good meal for somebody, and that is like 
it's it could be gluttony, but in reality, you're just trying to show how much you care and how much you're able to put on the line for your spouse. Um, you work hard during a day. That could be whatever, some scrupulosity, or or it could be a sin of 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 wanting to do the work and and being too stuck in, in this world or whatever, or, or being afraid of the consequences of the future. But you work hard not for yourself and your future, but for the future of those around you, of the the poor, the the children that have nothing. And you, and there's a nobility to that that I think we um, we see. So there's that shell, but there's also the core in it as well. And that right there is what tells us what we need to strive for. And in seeing that, you get a sense of real charity, of real beauty. And now, not only do you want to feed your children, but you want to feed the children that have nothing. And you not only want to uh, work hard for your own spouse, but you want to work hard for the spouse of Jesus Christ, the church. And you want to find um, all the good things of this world, but only if for the others. And now, now that's when the Holy Grail brings about the inner death, the part that you need to redeem yourself, you need to come to fullness in the terms. You can't linger in that anymore. You have to now go forth. And you don't have any choice at that point. You have to either take the full charity or take no charity. And no charity means you lose your princess. You lose what was good. You have to give it away. And now all of a sudden, your family and your life with your family is ruined. You can no longer make good meals for your children because you're, you lack charity. And to fully understand that, you have to also be charity, charitable to everybody else as well. So it's, it's those beautiful points where the Holy Grail, if we can grasp onto it in life, it will, it'll, uh, it'll just make things right. Is, that's what it really comes down to. That lost tradition, that lost beauty that, we, that would just shine so brightly that we would just know right from wrong. Um, yeah, I think this is what I went through pretty much already. That, yeah, 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 this is what it, what, how this affects our lives. All right, thank you. That's it for me. Um, you guys liked it. It was very good. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so um, I was just noticing my audio didn't look like it was coming through on the recording, but it was coming through otherwise. I'm going to turn the recording off now. There's no reason to do the drawing thing, and then we can. I'll talk to you about what you want to do with it after. All right. So...